Happy Sabbath, everyone. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath, everyone. And we do welcome you to this place. And I want to say a, plus, a pleasant welcome to those who are watching online. You know, last week, I was in Memphis, Tennessee. We had a wonderful time, and after I spoke Friday night, a group of ladies wanted to speak to me, and I didn't know them. They probably knew me, and they said, Pastor, now we are a believer in John Bunyan. They said, we have been following you intently on live stream. We have been watching the Pilgrim's Progress, and we are trying to stay clear of Mr. Worldly Wiseman. And so I thank God for that, amen? So we do want to welcome them and all those who are viewing via live stream. We're going to pray now as we get right into this morning's message. Let us, let us pray. Now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. As I stand between the living and the dead, dear God, I ask in a special way that you'll forgive me of my sins, you'll cleanse me of all unrighteousness, and you'll speak through me to your people. Dying, risen, pleading, soon to return and end this mortal age is our prayer in his all-sufficient name. Amen and amen. This morning's, I heard that we ran out of lesson, which is a good thing, and we'll seek to rectify that next week, but we are now continuing on lesson number six, the wicked gate, and we have now come to a critical point a critical point in the book. For those who don't know, we're actually going through the book, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And I want to tell you, if you haven't got a copy of this book, then you need to actually do yourself a favor. And get yourself a hardback copy of this, this, this book. It was written by a man John Bunyan, who spent the prime of his life in a Bedford jail in England. What was his crime? Did he rob anybody? Did he rape anybody? Did he kill anybody? Just because of the word of God. And the Apostle Paul says, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the intimation is if we are not now experiencing persecution... Maybe we're not living godly. And the devil doesn't find in you a worthy opponent. So I want to encourage you to get the book. It's out there in so many different forms. We have the newest version uh, on DVD, and I have about three different versions on audio. Now, we are two things we are told by the pen of inspiration that we can gleam when we begin to read this book. She said, Ellen Weiss says in Review and Herald, Review and Herald, uh, March 30, 1912, she says this, The book, The Pilgrim's Progress, portrays, portrays the Christian life so what? Now talk to me now, so what? So accurately. And it presents the love of Jesus, so what? So there are two things you will glean from this book. You will, you will glean an ac accurate portrayal of the Christian life. You will see yourself in this book. And if you don't see yourself in this book, then you're not a Christian. Trust me, you can quote me on that one. But it also presents the love of Jesus so attractively. And through the instrumentality of this book, hundreds, hundreds and thousands have been converted. John Bunyan says that if you, if you get a, a pen and you, and, and, and you poke Bunyan, he just bleeds Bible. Many have said next to, the, next to the King James Version Bible, all some of these little funny versions, but next to this book, this is the next greatest book. And I believe it. I believe it. Last time we left off, Miss Christian had an encounter with Mr. Worldly Wiseman. And he had given him worldly advice and caused him to deviate from the path of strict integrity. Finally, he was in a village of carnality, morality rather. 
And finally, he got himself out. He met the evangelist. The evangelist now puts Christian back on the right path. Now take your hand out. We are reading now. Bunyan said, then did Christian address himself to go back. An evangelist, after he had kissed him, gave him one smile and bed him what? Bed him God's. He now sets Christian back on the right path. Mr. Bunyan says, so he went on with haste. Neither spake he to any man by the way, nor if any asked him, would he vo vosafe them an answer. He went, little, sorry, he went like one that was all the while treading on forbidden ground, and could by no means think himself safe till he, he, has, he had got into a way which he left to follow Mr. Worldly Wise Man's counsel. Bonian says, now so... In the process of time, Christian got up to the what? To the gate. Now over the gate was written, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7, 7. And he knocked, therefore, more than once or twice. That's emphasis. Saying, May I now enter here? Will he within open to sorry me, though I have been an undeserving rebel? Then I shall not fail to sing his lasting praises on high. Bonnie says, at last there came a grave person to the gate named Mr. Who? Goodwill. And next week we'll take a look, an intimate look at Mr. Goodwill. Who asked him who was there, whence he came, and what he would have. Christian says, here is a poor unburdened uh, sinner. I come from the city of destruction, but I am going to Mount Zion that I may be delivered from the wrath to come. And would therefore, sir, since I am informed that this gate, emphasis gate, is, uh, is, the, 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 is, is the way thither, know if you are willing to let me in. Goodwill. I am willing with all my heart, said he, and with that he opened the gate. So when Christian was stepping in, the other gave him a pull. Then said Christian, what me is that? The other told him, a little distance from this gate there is erected a strong castle of which Beelzebub, the captain from thence, both he and them are there within shoot arrows at those who would come up to this gate. And if happily they may die before they can enter. Then said Christian, I rejoice and tremble. So, he, so when he was got in, the man at the gate asked him who directed him thither. Christian evangelist bade me come hither and knock as I did. And he said to you, sir, would tell me what I must do. Goodwill. An open door is before thee and no man can shut it. The wicked gate. What does the wicked gate stand for? And as I really and really looked at Bunyan, I deduced that the wicked gate, now a gate leads somewhere, you with me? It is an entrance into some, something or some building. The wicked gate, I want you to follow me now, fill it in now, in your handout, it represents true conversion and true conversion is an entrance into a new life am i talking truth now now let, let me try to put it this way when you think of a wicket you must think of cricket no i didn't play cricket first of all the ball was too heavy and that ball hits you man you're in trouble <laughs> Well, La Parks, he played cricket. But, beloved, when you think of wicked, I want you to think cricket. Not the phone company now, you know what I'm saying? But, 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 watch it now. It is said, the wicked is guarded by a batsman who with his bat attempts to prevent the ball from hitting the what? The wicked. The origin of, this, of, of the word is from the standard definition of a wicked or a small gate. 
So when you think wicked, when you think cricket, you've got to think small. You've got to think narrow. Are you with me? Yeah. Beloved, it is said from a Christian's perspective that there are three things an individual must do or they have never experienced life in its fullest. First one, you've got to be born. You've got to get married. And you've got to be born again. Now, the latter two may not, you know, may not be in, in their perspective order, but from, from heaven's perspective this morning, if you have not really experienced these three things, you have not really enjoyed the fullness of life as how God intended it. Now, what is true conversion? Some say it's just by raising a hand. Some say it's just by coming down the altar, weeping and, and bawling. Beloved, true conversion now, watch it now, in your handout. True conversion entails, watch it now, the embracing of who? In all his offices. Emphasis, all his offices, plural. And his offices are what? Threefold. The prophet, a priest, and a king. These three offices were established on the basis of grace. So when a person is truly converted, he will embrace Jesus Christ in all his three offices. You cannot say, I'm going to embrace him as a prophet and don't want him as a priest. Or you don't want him as a priest and a prophet, but you want him as a king. That's not true conversion. No, when you un, 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 unload this, it is very deep. Now fill it in now as a prophet. A prophet, next page please, a prophet number two. Right? A prophet, right? A prophet is to teach us, fill it in now, that we are a sinner and in need of a who? Savior. Fill it in now, please. I should have underscored Savior, right? But when we embrace Jesus as a prophet, we are saying that he's going to teach us that we are a sinner and that we are in need of a who? Savior. Where do you find that? In Acts chapter 2. These texts are on the screen to help us expedite time. They're also in your handout. Acts 3.22. The Bible says this. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a who? A prophet shall the Lord your God rise up unto you from your brethren like unto me. Him shall he hear in all things whatsoever ye shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Moses was making reference really to Jesus Christ. You must embrace him in his prophetic office. That means you're going to study prophecy. You must love prophecy because he's a prophet. Are you with me? Secondly now, we must embrace him as a priest. Fill it in now. A priest, fill it in now, underscore, to intercede on our behalf before the who? Before the Father. Before the Father. Underscore Father. I didn't underscore that one. Feel. Fill it in, please. So a priest to intercede. On our behalf, before the Father. Beloved, we do not need a mediator between Jesus and man. No. The Church of Rome says yes. No, that's wrong. But we need a mediator, a priest, between God and man, which is Jesus Christ. But we do not need a mediator between Jesus and man. A priest, Hebrews 7.25, the Bible says this now about Christ's priestly office. Paul says, wherefore he is what? Oh, let me stop there. You know, you, we are not run past word. Paul is saying that God is able. You know, there are some people, they are willing to help, but they are not able. There are some people who are able, 
Them folks are not willing. And some folks are just, they're not willing and not able. But thank God that Jesus is both willing, God, able. God, he's willing, the Bible says, and able to save them to the uttermost that come unto him by God's seed. He ever liveth to do what? To maketh intercession for us. 26 says, for such an high priest became who holy, harmless, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So we must embrace Jesus in his prophetic office, also in his priestly office, but I love it now. We must also embrace him as a king. A king, fill it in now, to rule, underscore, to rule over our lives, to our will, unto his will. So when a man is truly converted, he embraces Jesus in his threefold office as a prophet to instruct us in righteousness, as a priest to intercede for us, as a king to subdue our wicked and sinful nature. That is true conversion in its essence. Now question number two now. What directive did Jesus give to those who are seeking eternal life. I have two texts. We we'll look at the latter first. Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. What instruction did Jesus give to those who are seeking eternal life, who are seeking true conversion? Luke 13, Jesus says this. He says, strive to enter at the what? Now you see, beloved, if you think conversion was an easy thing, then Jesus would not say strive. And how do I know it's not an easy thing? Look what he says now. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter into conversion, but will not be able to, because it requires striving, brothers and sisters. It requires effort. He says, when once the master of the house is risen up, and shall shut the door. There it is, the door, the gate, the entrance. He says, and begin to stand without, shall knock at the door and say, Lord, Lord. When I was in school, my home analytics teacher told me, he says, when you see a repetition, Lord, Lord, it means emphasis to those who are looking for the second advent of Jesus. Lord, Lord, it's our, our day, end time. Lord, Lord shall say unto you, I know you not whence come. So the answer is, Jesus bids us to strive, my dear friends. Strive to enter into true conversion. Because half the conversion today is a pseudo-conversion. Just a waving of the hand. Some water sprinkle on people. Say five Hail Marys. Where I'm from, Hail Mary is something a quarterback throws. We have baptized that and brought it in churches. So Jesus bids us to strive. Our opening text, second text now, he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to what? Destruction. And how many? Many there be. Many. Verse 14 says, because straight is the gate. Now look how that word straight is spelled. It's not spelled S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. But rather S-T-R-A-I-T, which means narrow. Now the straight gate leads to the narrow way. Now week after next, if we are here, if the rapture hasn't taken place, <laughs> we will take a look at the narrow way. But the narrow way is not the straight gate. The straight gate now leads into a narrow way. Are you with me? Look what he says now. And few brothers and sisters, few people will enter into true conversion. Now what Bunyan really means, you see this text in its historical sense, in, in ancient times, churches in England, they had two doors. You had a big door, and you had a door within the door. So like on Sundays, in, in those days, they would open the door to let the masses in. But on weekdays, like, you know, weekday service, they wouldn't use the big door, they would use the small door. 
And what Bunyan was saying in the church of England in his day, many people who came into the church did not come through the, this gate. They came through the broad gate. Thus there was what you call a pseudo-conversion. The true conversion is when you come through the narrow gate. It is an experience. Jimi Hendrix was born November 27th, 1942 in Seattle, Washington. And after years in the Big Apple, it is said that Jimi Hendrix had many experiences because he used to smoke ganja. At the age of 32, he produced his most renowned works entitled, You Are Experienced. Are you experienced, pardon me? In September 18th, 1970, he moved to London, England to promote that tour, You Are Experienced. Are you experienced, pardon me? But through his experience, it led him to a fatal death. The record said in September 18, 1970, Jimi Hendrix was found dead in a basement in a hotel in London. He died after drinking too much and taking too many sleeping pills. And I believe that this man, God created him to fill a special place in the great controversy. And let me tell you something. If you do not fill that place which God has created, you will surely fill that place which Satan has created. There is no neutral ground. My dear friends, this man had an experience. But was his experience true? And many folks are experiencing things in churches. But is that experience really true? And my dear friends, in the coming crisis, we are going to have... We need an experience, and that experience is true conversion. I read to you from the book, Great Conversy. It's in your handout. Servant of the Lord says, the time of trouble, such as never is soon to open before us, and we shall need an experience, which is true conversion, which we do not now possess. And which many are too indolent. That word indolent means lazy. So you can obtain it. But they don't want to strive. Are you with me? It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. And I had to stop there. You know, when I was a young boy, and you grew up in Jamaica, and we got, we got in trouble in school. And we would say, boy, when we get home, grandma going to give it to us. And you're walking and you're thinking, is she going to beat you with the broom? Or with the switch, or with the belt. How are you gonna get it when you're sleeping, when you're taking a shower? You're just thinking, how, how is she gonna creep upon you? <laughs> and that, that thing almost drives you to cyanosis. You don't know. You're wondering, you're wondering. And finally, when you come home, you, you, you sneak in, do your chores, and finally, bedtime. And you say, What? It wasn't really all that bad. I just I almost killed myself. <laughs> But beloved, but with this, it's going to be bad. Oh, it's going to be really, really bad. But we need an experience. She says the most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that fiery trial, every soul must stand for himself before God. And she quotes Ezekiel 14, 20, that though Noah and Job and Daniel be in the land, they shall deliver but their own soul. My dear friends, we need an experience. And that experience is the wicked gate. It is true conversion. I want you to consider question number three now. What, search, what heart searching question did Jesus put to Nicodemus? Now Nicodemus was a very wealthy man in Jerusalem. And the Bible says in the book of John, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, I'm reading. The Bible says, and there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler. Now stop there. The very fact he was a Pharisee means he was not a novice. 
and he was a ruler. So he was somebody. And the Bible says now that the same came to Jesus by night. He wouldn't come by the end. Too many of us will still want to come to Christ by night. Where I'm from, they say the freaks come out at night. Night in his soul. Night in his religious experience. And he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things, do his miracles, that thou doest, except God be with him. Verse 3, no, no, Jesus, he just cut to the chase. In a long argument thing with this man, you know. You trying to play games with me, Nicodemus. You is a Pharisee and you is a ruler. So Christ just threw the, he said, listen man, let me just cut to the chase. And he answered, except a man be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus was trying to play mind games with Jesus. Because he well knew that when a heathen was converted to Judaism, he was called born again. Are you with me? Verse 4 says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter in a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you, you miss it one time, let me put it this way in Jerusalem language, except you are born of water and the Spirit. That is conversion. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is what? Flesh, emphasis, and that which is born of the Spirit is So Jesus says, fill it now. He says, you must be born again. You've got to be born again, Nicodemus. And money can't acquire it. I read somewhere that two goats can mate and produce a goat. Two horses can mate and produce a horse. Two donkeys can mate and produce a donkey. But two Christians can get together and they cannot produce a Christian. I hear folks say, I'm born in the church. What does that really mean? Oh, you were born seven Adventists. And what? You've got to be born again. Amen. God doesn't have grandchildren, you know. <laughs> you know how grandparents do. We spoil our grandkids. But look at this now. But he said that which is born of flesh is what? Beloved, let me tell you something. When we are born, we are born with propensities or pro proclivity to evil. Yeah, we are not, we don't go bad. <laughs> we is born bad. <laughs> we don't have an expiration date on us. We'll expire when you reach 15. No, we are born bad. David says, behold, I was shaped in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. And Job says, a man uh, born of a woman is a, is a few days full of trouble. It's a matter of time. And because we're born of the flesh, Jesus says now, because we're born of the flesh, watch it now, we will naturally commit the works of the flesh. Now what is the works of the flesh or what are the works of the flesh? You jot this text down, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, what are the works, what are the works of the flesh? Galatians chapter 5, Paul give a litany of them. He says now the works of the what? Flesh, that's the natural heart. The unconverted heart. Our manifest which are these are adultery. In other words, beloved, the natural man is prone to commit adultery. Because it's the flesh. And if given the space and the time, you will commit. You will sleep with somebody's husband or seduce somebody's wife. Keep your eye off my wife, please. <laughs> are you with me? That's what it is. You're prone to commit fornication. It's fleshly. <laughs> no, you're not trained. You took a course how to commit adultery. Who took that course? Who has that degree? No. He says, Paul says, uncleanness and lasciviousness. And I looked it up. It means old man peeping at naked girls. Lasciviousness. <laughs> and if you live long enough, and old enough, and you're not converted, we will commit these things. He says idolatry. And let me tell you something. We say, oh, not here in America. Let me tell you something. Whatsoever receives your first affection is your God. Witchcraft, we don't do that, really. What do you think Disney World is? 
and magic kingdom. What? Hatred, variances, strife, sedition, envy, murder, drunkenness, religion. And he says, you will not, if you do these things, you will not enter heaven. So these are the works of the flesh. My dear friends, we will commit these things. Are you with me? So therefore we need a change. A radical change. And all through the Bible, we have metaphors. Metaphors for conversion. Now, one of the most practical demonstrations of what conversion is, in a nutshell, fill it in now, is found in Acts 26, 18. Paul says, turning from darkness to light. That's what it is, you know. From darkness to light, he says, from the power of Satan unto the power of God. That is conversion in a nutshell. But it must embrace the threefold office of Jesus, a prophet, a priest, and a king. Now, my dear friends, let me tell you something. We have enemies at the gate of conversion. Let me tell, that's why Jesus says strive. They are enemies, and I want to read something to you. It's in your handout, Deserve Ages, page 19. Some of the Lord says this, never. And where I'm from, they say never, never happens too often. Never does one leave the ranks of evil for the service of God without encountering the assault of Satan. Oh, you're going to get it. It will come from your unconverted husband. See, all is peace and, and nice when you're in sin. But when you decide to go through that wicked gate, arrows will be pulled at you. Sometimes the boss will fire you. You will get it, man. Your professor will hate you. He will give you that C minus. Now, one thing to get a D or an F. But to get a C minus, and it's a required course, it means you've got to take it all over again. You will get it, my dear friends. So never. And the devil doesn't say, well, you know what? We've been good buddies all our lives now. I'm sad to see you go, you know, but listen, I give you good advice. Pray, please. Please, I'm begging you, pray. Hide the scriptures in your heart. <laughs> and as often as church is open, go. Witness. Live a life of service. <laughs> no. <laughs> and the reason why he's so determined, you see, every soul who is lost, He's going to have to, every soul who is saved, he's going to burn for that soul. But every soul who is lost, they'll burn for themselves. So the heat is on him. Never does one leave Satan's camp without encountering, he will wreck your car on 95, man. Burn your house down. Cut your throat. Kill your kids. He will use every arrow. Now his point is, as Bunyan says, Bunyan says, Beelzebub in your hand out, the captain from thence, he shoots arrows at those who will come at the gate so that they will die just before they enter into true conversion. Because if you die outside of true conversion, you is lost. That's the whole object. He wants to kill you. And all through the Bible, we have seen people who came to the wicked gate and as they're about to enter, Lucifer, give me an arrow, demon, bam, 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 and kill the man right before he entered. And he died outside. I give you three examples. Question four, what disheartening words did King Agrippa, King Agrippa say to Paul? Now God was using Paul mightily. And in Acts, it's on the screen, Acts 26, 24. The Bible says this now. And as he thus spake, uh, he thus spake for himself, Festus with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. Now I want to tell you today, when I hear some arguments in our church come from learned people, I say, brother, much learning doth make thee mad. But from Paul's perspective, he wasn't mad. And look what Festus says now. The Bible says this now, but he said, I am not mad, Paul. I am most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. 26 now, and King 
For, for the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in the corner. And a King Agrippa, King Agrippa, believes thou the prophets and knowest and thou believest. And uh, sorry, I know that thou believest. Look what the king now said now. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost, Paul. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. My dear friends, King Agrippa was convinced. He was convicted. My dear friends, he almost became a Christian. And then the arrows hit him. This man was what you call convicted but never converted. And we don't, the devil doesn't plan. If man, if he have a church full up here, convicted convicts. And you can die in your conviction, my dear friends. The emphasis is conversion. He was convicted. Almost you persuade me. <laughs> and the arrow, Satan used an arrow. And Paul never had another audience with this brother. And many said this man died outside the wicked gate. I want you to consider uh, 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 Felix. Question five, what cynical request did Felix make after the apostle, uh, uh, make of the apostle Paul? Paul is before Felix now. And in Acts 24, 25, the Bible says this now. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ. And the Bible says now, as, and, and as he reasoned Paul, the Holy Ghost came upon Paul, and he reasoned of what? Righteousness, which is the law. Right doing. Of temperance, that is eating right, eating the good things, leaving the bad things, and of judgment to what? The Bible says Felix what? He was convicted. He, he, and the Bible says, Satan, that rascal. Before the man could enter the gate, he pulled a bow. And you know what the man said? Uh, go that way now, Paul. When I have a convenient season. My dear friends, there was never another convenient season. This man died outside the wicked gate. And you'll never have another convenient season than now. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the good things, well, you know, when you go to court, you, you know, I don't, I, I don't really feel that bad because everybody here is convicted of something. So, you know, you, you, we're in the same crowd here. You know what I'm saying? So, it kind of lessens the atmosphere. And in church, all of us are sinners, you know. This is the convenient season. This is the convenient season. You will never have another season like this one. And the devil used an arrow. And this man never entered true conversion. Now, this one is so sad. What pointed question did Pilate put to Jesus? Beloved, you know, this is rare because very few people had a one-to-one -one encounter with Christ. And they oftentimes say, you know, if, if I had Christ's uh, audience, what would I ask him? You know, if, if President Barack Obama was to invite you to wife, what would you ask him? You would think that thing out. You only have one shot. You want to make it count. So Pilate now is before Jesus. Christ is salvation. Are you with me? Look what he asks Jesus now. John 18, 38, the Bible says this. Pilate answered unto him. Said unto him, what is truth? That's a fair question. What is truth? And the Bible says now, and when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews. And saith unto him, I find no fault in him. So he asked him, to fill it now, he asked him, what is truth? But before Jesus could give him an answer, Satan pulled an arrow. And those deceived Jews called him outside. And when he came back inside, the man had Jesus crucified. He approached the gate. In Lord Bacon's essay of truth, you ought to get it. You know, I got it, but you can get it free online. You can Google it. It's a very challenging reading, but it's a good reading. 
1902, Bacon's essay of truth, he said this, what is truth, said Justin Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. Implying that there was an answer, but did not want to hear it. My dear friends, Satan used the arrow to hit Pilate just before he entered the wicked gate. And Mr. Weiss says, when he came back inside, she said, Pilate's, Pilate's golden opportunity had passed. Pilate was convicted, but never converted. Now, the thing, the arrow that, 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 that Satan used to change Pilate's mind was found in John chapter 19, verse 12. So, he asks Christ the question. He steps outside. Now, when he steps outside, the Bible says this now. And from thence, from henceforth, Pilate sought to do what? So when he was inside the judgment hall, he really wanted to release him. But look at the arrows now. But the who? But the Jews cried out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. You see, Julius Caesar was his boss. His employer, his despotic lord if he must rise in the army he must earn julius caesar's smile and that was the arrow that satan used and many of god's people we are still tempted by this temptation the boss says if you must rise if you must keep your job you've got to work one sabbath if you must keep your job, you must come to our parties and laugh at our dirty jokes. And my dear friends, like Pontius Pilate, many are hit by the arrows. And you know what's so sad? It's like a double whammy with Pilate. Because when you read the Zara of Ages, I want to read to you a very cogent statement. Not in your handout. I only had one page to print on, you know. I want you to look up, jot this down. She said this about Pontius Pilate now. This is of ages, page 7, 8, 738. She says this, Pilate now, quoting, rather than losing his position, so rather than risk lose, losing his position, he what? He delivered up Jesus to be what? To be crucified. But in spite of his what? Precautions. The what? Very thing he dreaded afterward came upon him. His honors were stripped away from him. He was cast down from my office. Now that's one thing. Not and stung by remorse, wounded by pride. Not long after the crucifixion, sometime after 31 AD, he ended his own life. Pontius Pilate committed suicide. So all who compromise with sin will gain only sorrow and ruin. My dear friend, the bees carry honey in his pack, but he has a sting in his tail. The fish leaps at the bait and don't know it's a hook. And I'm sin will take you, keep you longer than you plan to stay and take you further than you plan to go. It's like a winding river. And then she quotes Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are death and destruction. Now, I must hurry. What about Agrippa? Ellen White says this now, deeply uh, affected Agrippa for the moment, lost sight of his surrounding and the dignity of his position, conscious only of the truth which he had heard, seen only the humble prisoner standing before him as God's ambassador. He answered involuntarily, almost. And so the same thing with his wife and Bernice. My dear friends, Satan wounded them at the wicked gate. They never entered into true conversion. 
Beloved, we have a serious problem in our churches. That half of us, we are not converted. And if we were, we lost our conversion. My dear friends, God is calling for a reconversion of Seventh-day Adventists. Reconversion. I want to read to you a two cogent statement, not in your handout, right? This one is not in your handout, but I want you to jot it down. Spiritual gifts, uh, book two, spiritual gifts, book two, page two, five, six. Not in your handout. She says this. I saw that there was, I saw that unless, pardon me, there's an entire change in the young, a what? Thorough conversion. They may despair of heaven. From what, from what has been shown me, there is not more than half the young who profess the truth have been truly converted. And back then, they never had Facebook, never had Instagram, Snapchat, call it what you will. They never had light. They never had all the immaculations to divert and distract the mind. And she could say back then, I didn't even have. Now, what would she say today? Well, look what happened now. Right? From what I've been oh, truly converted. If they had been converted, they would be a what? Not nuts. Fruits. To the glory of God. Many are leaning upon a supposed hope with no true foundation. Now, she says, the fountain is not cleansed. Therefore, the stream proceeding from the fountain is not pure. Cleanse the fountain. And the streams will be what? Here it is now. If the heart is right, your words will be right. Your dress will be appropriate. Your acts will be all right. You see, a light on the dashboard of your car tells you something is wrong under the... If you crank your engine and it says the check engine, you don't say, let's get that bulb out of my car. You don't get a screwdriver and try to pry that thing out. It means you got to fly the what? Hood. So when you see people dressing so sexy, and I'm telling you, church is not the place to be looking sexy. It's not the place. Modesty is God's rule of adornment, brothers and sisters. So you see, Appropriate dress, appropriate words, appropriate lifestyle is an indication that something is wrong under the that the heart is never thoroughly touched by the grace of God. Because when the heart is touched, everything else will fall in light. She says, I would not dishonor my master as to admit a careless, trifling, prayerless person. A Christian, no, no, no. A Christian has victory over resentment over his passions. Now, here comes the punchline now, in your handout. In your handout now. Here it is now. Here it is now. The Lord calls for a decided what? Reformation. Here it is now. And when that soul is what? Truly converted, let him be what? Rebaptized. When the soul is truly converted... When you've embraced Christ as a prophet, priest, and king, let that soul be rebaptized. And you have to be baptized first to be. Look what she says now. She says this let him renew his what? With God, right? With God, right? Reconversion must take place, right? Must take place uh, among the members. As God's witness, they may testify uh, the authoritative power of truth. In their soul. When that soul is reconverted, my dear friends, she says, let that soul be rebaptized. I want you to think on that. Think on that. So, question seven how, how do I know that I have entered the straight gate? How do I know that I am converted? How do I really know? Is there a, is there a test I can take? Well, this is the test in the Bible. Paul gives us a litany test. And you, you can't fake these, you know, because what's on the inside will one of these days come out. This is the test if we have really entered the straight gate, true conversion. Paul says now, but the fruits, there it is. Of the Spirit is what? Love, and love is a holy and high principle. 
Love is not feelings. You love God, you're not going to steal, my dear friends. It's love, joy. You'll be happy even things are, though things are discouraged around you. Ain't got nowhere to live. You're still happy in Jesus. You're walking, catching the bus. You're just rejoicing in the Lord. You're joyful, brothers and sisters. The world don't know this joy. Peace. Long suffering. How often shall I forgive, Lord? Seventy times. Seven. Gentleness. It can't be rough and brutish and Oh, chivalry. And nothing is more repulsive than a rough Seventh-day Adventist. And especially females. You've got to be gentle. Goodness and faith, meekness. And, me and they say, it is said that, that meekness is not weakness. It is strength under control. And let me tell you something, an evidence that a man is strong, he's usually meek. You know, strong things are not easily agitated. You know this little chihuahua dog? But the lion is majesty. Strong. You walk past him, he's so strong, he's just meek. It takes a lot to get the lion off his feet, brothers and sisters. Temperance. What does it mean? It means you're going to abstain from all the junk. And the good stuff, you're going to eat in moderation. Honey is good, but if you eat too much honey, you'll get your big toe cut off. It, you, you will. So, this is the evidence that a man is truly confident enough by demonstrating that he has the fruits of the Spirit. That is an evidence that a man has entered into the straight gate, my dear friends. So have you entered the straight gate this morning? I want to read to you several quotations as we bring this thing to a close. This, this is so cogent. I want to read it to you real quickly. In your handout, she says, so the answer is by demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit in his lives. Capital S, Spirit. Now, you know, it's amazing that we think that not every... Well, let me not say it. Let me, let me, let me, let me go on. Mrs. White says, one soul truly converted will bring... Well, first, let me back up. The paragraph says, actually, the apostles, one of the strongest evidence of true conversion is love to who? God and to man. You're going to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. You will love God and love to live for God and to man. She says, now, one, is, one soul truly converted will bring others to Christ. When a man has entered the straight gate, he will seek to invite somebody to church. Bring somebody to Jesus. It's an evidence. She goes on to say, one who is truly converted will work, will work to serve others who are in darkness. When you're truly converted, my dear friends, you will serve God. And the man who serves God will never, never regret it. The Bible says, he that keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruits thereof, and he that waiteth upon the Lord shall be honored. Amen. If you're truly converted, my dear friends, you will work to, to save others, rather, from darkness. She says, thirdly, the Bible gives no endorsement for idleness. It is the greatest, greatest curse in our world. Here it is now, every man and woman who is truly converted will be a diligent worker. And it's so sad, you know, you have to beg and people to serve Jesus in his own church. And isn't it ironic? You're at your job and you know your workload is heavy. And you're underpaid over work. And the boss man comes and says, guess what, Mr. So-and-so, we have noticed your diligent service. We're going to promote you. He's not giving you more pay, but more work. And you'll say, Thank you, sir. <laughs> You'll take on more work for less pay, and it is God who gives you power to get wealth. But when you come to serve God, I'm tired of what? Half of you only come to church once on Sabbath anyway. And some of you sleep during the service. And then you say you is tired of serving Jesus. What kind of service are you doing? Diligent, my dear friends. 
Why is it we're so diligent when it comes to the secular things? But to God's work, you got to beg the man, please, it's a serve. And I, let me tell you something, you know, it's very simple, you know. If we don't have nobody to serve in his office, then scrap the office and let the church roll on. Amen. You have to, listen, say, you, you'll be a diligent worker for Jesus, man. He goes on to say now, Another, every truly converted soul will, will have a spirit of service. And you will serve. You will serve. She says, parents who are truly converted, truly converted, will reveal in their home life the light that, char that shines the farthest, shines the brightest at home. Let me say it again. The light that shines the farthest, shines the brightest at home. They will bring their lives under the discipline of the word of God to the mother and the father. Right training of your children is the most important work. And you know, especially as Jamaican people, we are a very, we are a very proud people, you know. That's going to be our demise. I'm telling you. And some of us, we are more concerned about our kids getting the academia but when it comes on to the spirituality part, it's of little consequence. And my dear friend, let me, let me, let me give you a reality check. Because I live in a real world, you know. And I've read the book. When we are brought before the courts, that judge ain't going to ask you, who was the first president of these United States? What does MC pi equals square? That's even a formula. He's going to ask you, you said the law of God is nailed to the cross. Prove it. You said that the Antichrist system is the Catholic Church. Prove it. You said that the Sabbath is the seal of God. Prove it. Prove it. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be educated, mind it, but I'm telling you something. I'd rather go to heaven dumb than to bust hell fire wide open, sum cum laude, make cum laude, and all these other laudies. <laughs> Do not hear with me, my dear friends. Because true education is to love and serve God first. And a time is coming you'll wish, parents, that you had your kids memorize those texts. You will wish. You hadn't had them playing PlayStation and Xbox solo. You will wish. Trust me. Trust me. Look at this thing now. A truly converted. I love this. Those who are truly converted will press together in unity. There'll be no division amongst us. There are forces amongst us today who are seeking to divide the church. I'm praying that God will shake them out of office. And there are people, you watch them on YouTube, these upset preachers. They have a beef with the church. All they do is just highlight the dirt of the church. Now let me ask you a question. If you had a wife, and every Sabbath you came and said, my wife can't cook. My wife can't cook. My wife can't cook. Then you're going to ask me, Pastor Not, would you come to lunch? No, because you said your wife can't cook. So if you highlight the dirt of your house, why would anybody would feel comfortable of coming to your house? Amen. Now I'm saying we should have called sin by its right name, but my difference, you don't want to highlight the faults of the church so bad that those in Babylon say, man, your church got issues. Why would I leave my church to come to your crack church? And we watch these YouTube bites. They're causing division. God is not fragmented in this church. We want unity. There should be no division in the church of God. Watch it now. I love this now. Men and women who have been, have, have, many have had habits of antagonistic the principles of the Bible. The victims of strong drink, tobacco are corrupted, body, soul, and spirit. Such ones should not be received into the church until they have evidence of they are truly converted. So if we know people who is willingly still using ganja and drinking alcohol, better work it out. Work that thing out. Work it out. And once you work it out, then we will give you a hand fellowship. What he's saying, here it is now. 
The truth of God will purify the true believer. He who is thoroughly converted, here it is now, will abandon every defiling habit. These secret vices that you're doing and you don't think nobody's watching. You're destroying yourself and doctors says it's healthy. It ain't healthy. Now I'm speaking in parables because we got children here. But you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And habit. Once you're thoroughly converted, you may be struggling, but God, please give me the victory. You will abandon every defiling habit and every defiling practice. Now this one is deep now. You need to hold on to the seats now. The truly converted man has no inclination to think or talk of the faults of others. I didn't want to think about it, Lord. Lay along. If you're truly converted, you will not talk about Ella Woodbine or Ella Parks or whoever or who or so and so. You will not. If you're truly converted. But if you're not converted, you won't chat. And you have to have hearers. If there's no hearers, you can't have no channels. You're chatting to yourself and you'll be stone crazy. But if you're truly converted, you will have no inclination. You wouldn't. Look what she says now. His lips are what? To God. We need especially the God against our tongue sanctified to who? If you are truly converted, you would not do that. But if you're not, then you're going to do it because the flesh only does the flesh works. Note then as I close, if you do not exhibit the fruits of the spirits, then you will exhibit the fruits of the flesh. Now this is imperative now. Look what she says now. What are they? Fruits of the flesh and the fruit is carelessness, indifference, Lack of watchfulness and what? And you know, if you're not concerned about your own salvation, why are, would you be concerned about somebody else's? Now, this is serious. See, many of us in the church, we have what is called a roller coaster religious experience. What do I mean by that? We have this spasmatic prophetic event. That's how most of us are. Let me explain. May, March 20, 2013, Pope Francis, first Jesuit, was, it, uh, was, was installed. Radar was high. We had a high experience. Oh, the end is upon us. The end is upon us. The end is upon us. Preacher, the end is upon us. You're praying more, studying more. But by and by, things simmer out. And you get back into your lukewarmness. And you're chill, spasmatic, spasmatic, spasmatic. Then yesterday, June 26, Lord have mercy. Supreme Court. One woman called me, Pastor, what you going to preach on? I say the pilgrim's progress. What is that? <laughs> you need to preach on son of me. The end is upon us. I said, get hence Satan. I said it in my mind. <laughs> spasmatic. No, Jesus told us a long time ago. Didn't Jesus tell you? Yeah. As it was in the days of Lot. Yeah. What? What? what it, it just affirm what the Bible says. Yeah. So they have a spasmatic. It was said he rode a quarter million mile on horseback. But in spite of everything, John Wesley struggled with conversion. When he came to Georgia, it was not until he met the Moravians. And they really school. Now, this is a learned man, you know. But he struggled with true conversion. How can I know God if I'm converted? And when he was converted, he gave five steps towards true conversion. As I let you go. One, he says, first, you've got to recognize your sins. That's the first step. The text he gives is 1 Timothy 1.15, where Paul says, I am the chief of sinner. I am the biggest sinner in this church. Chief, of, recognize your sins. Then he says, secondly, you've got to lament them. Some of us, we don't mourn our wickedness. He quotes James 4, 9. James says, you've got to be afflicted, mourn and weep over your decrepit self. 
turn heaviness into mourning and bitterness. You've got to lament your sins. And he says, thirdly, understand that nothing you can do will ever blot them out. You can work, you can pray, you can give, you can sacrifice. The Bible says, Isaiah 43, 25, even I and I am alone who blotted out their transgressions. Nothing you can do. Then he says, I love this. He says, fourthly, then you've got to throw yourself on the mercy of Christ and his redeeming blood. He quotes John 17, 16. He says that, and they fell down at his feet giving thanks. You've got to throw yourself on Christ and say, Lord, have mercy on me. And then he says, fifthly, he says, brethren, then pray for new birth. He says, beseech, entreat, employ, beg for it. You know, you know, my cousin, I told you the story. Last week, he went to get sentenced. The first officer to be sentenced to be found guilty of vehicle manslaughter in Broward County, 27 years old. He was responding to a call at age 21. A, a young lady cut in front of him. He hit the back of her car. She was ejected. She died a Caucasian young girl. Never had her seatbelt on. They, he let him go because he was on probation as a, a rookie out, 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 out of school. And the case was going on. He was found guilty on four counts of vehicle manslaughter. And it was, and folks are shooting people down in broad daylight. And they're getting off by insanity. Them folks ain't insane. Them folks are crazy. And look what happened now. He went to court last week. Boy, when I called him, I said, Frank, was, he said, man, not, I'm preparing myself for the worst. My wife moved in with my, his mother, and we've made arrangements for the worst because I may not leave that courthouse. My dear friends, you can watch it on, it was on channel. You can watch it on, 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 online. It was a solemn event in that courthouse. And even the victim's family began to plead, oh, Your Honor, please don't give him, don't send us him. Use his time more profitable to go out and to warn kids of, drink, of driving fast. And, and the father says, no, 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 no. My daughter is dead. and He must go to jail. And finally, Frank got up. You must understand, vehicle manslaughter is 15 years in prison. That young man pleaded <laughs> for his life. Man, you talk about pleading. Pleading for his life. And in spite of all that pleading, the judge gave the man nine years in prison. I know when David says, Lord, let me fall in your hands, but not in the hands of mankind. Let me tell you something. When you plead like that to Jesus, he will have mercy on you. Yeah. But you know, the judge, there was a bigger, bigger judge. And he didn't have the final sway. And finally, the, 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 the attorney says, give him, give him bond. He's not getting any bond. He's going to jail right now. You want to get this thing done. They cuffed him, took him off. I'm driving to Mississippi now, at Memphis, Tennessee, talking to his sister. Finally, we got a, we got a, we are, I got a text. Frank is released. I said, how? Ah, the Lord worked in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. Hallelujah. That judge was out of the way now. So they went to a fair judge. You know, when you go to the courthouse, you see that woman, she's blindfolded, right? You know what it means? That justice is blind. But sometimes she peeks. And in that case, she was peeking. So they got a new judge. And when he heard the arguments, he gave him bail to appeal his case. It can take two to three years, and he's praying that that thing will be thrown out because it was an accident. But my point is that, my dear friend, that man pleaded for his life, and that judge still gave the man. Even the prosecutor was shocked. Like, oh, God. We thought you would give him about two and a half years, man. He gave, he gave him the full sentence because he was on probation for about seven years. No mercy. But when you pray and plead for new birth, let me tell you something Jesus Christ will hear. David says, oh Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew that right spirit within me. 
John Wesley's five steps to conversion. And I believe it, my dear friends. And John Wesley, he said, he said, he said this. He said, grasp by the day of salvation before the long night comes. My dear friends, we're told almost saved means wholly lost. In your handout, the road to hell is paved with a lot of good intentions. What is the remedy? She says there is a remedy then for the sin sick soul. What is it? That remedy is Jesus. Go to your closet, she says, and there plead the verb, plead with God. Oh God, create in me a clean heart and renew your right spirit. She says, be earnest. Be since you can't fool God. And he's not impressed by your highfalutin words. Fervent prayer avail it much. You can pray your husband into heaven. You know that? There's somebody here, you have an unconverted husband, unconverted wife. You can pray that wife or husband to heaven. You know that? The Bible says a fervent prayer of the righteous avail it much. Jacob wrestling prayer, agonize, and that is the word strive. Strive in the Greek means agonize, agonize your mind. She says, Jesus, Lord, drip, uh, sweat, drops of blood, you must make an effort. Do not leave your cloth until you feel strong in the Lord. Then she says, then watch. You know, I met a guy the other day, a friend of mine, and he had a, a bumble, you know those bumblebee cell phones. I said, what is that, brother? That's the dark ages. Come out of Egypt. <laughs> I mean, big old buttons. I said, man, you make, get your iPhone, man. He says, not you don't understand my past. He says, I have a strong weakness. He says, and part of my watchfulness, I can't trust myself on the internet. Read through the lines. Triple X. He says, part of my watchfulness, I have to get a phone where I cannot go online. He says, I have purposely banned myself from the internet. That's how you pay your bills. He says, my wife pays all my bills. That man is serious and he's watching. He can't trust himself. You've got to watch, he says. Watch it now. Watch. Then you can keep these evil besetments under. The grace of God will appear in you you know as you consider our pioneers as I close they were thoroughly converted man every one of them they were so converted and that is why they did so much with so little we do so little with so much they never had the education we had some of us have two, three, four cars, four or five houses. What? They never had that. 50 cents James White had. You see, your little is much. And God is in it. And your much is little when God is not in it. They were thoroughly converted. And let me tell you something. The people, young people who God used to finish this work, let me tell you something, Acreage. They are going to be thoroughly converted. They will press through the wicked gate. And my last quote is this. At the 11th hour, the Lord will call into his service faithful workers, self-sacrificing men and women who will step into the place made vacant by apostasy and death. Here it is, not a punchline. To the young men, young women, as well as those who are older, God will give power from where? Here it is now. With converted minds and converted and converted and converted tongue. Their lips will be touched by the living coal divine altar. They will go forth in the master's service carrying the work upward, onward, forward to completion. Thoroughly converted. I want you to listen to this song as we bring this part to its close.
seems now some soul to say, go spirit, go thy way, some more convenient day on thee. and I want to make a very specific call this morning the very fact that you're in church it doesn't mean you're Christian it doesn't mean you have been truly converted and as you sit this morning I don't know where you are but Jesus knows have you entered the wicked gate is Jesus Christ your all is he, is he your hope, your crown of rejoicing? Can you answer this morning? How do you answer? When that soul is truly converted, let that soul be rebaptized. Perchance, my dear friends, you want to be in that group. We have a few already. But you want to say, preacher, I want to renew my walk with Jesus a second time. Or maybe I've never given Christ a chance for the first time. But when that soul is reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. That is your desire. I want you to slip from your seat this morning and just come to the front. Praise God, my sister. Not time to be peeking around now. Enter the straight gate, Jesus says. True conversion. The heart is right. Your dress is going to be right. Your attitude will be right. Is there somebody else? Is there one more? Praise God, my brother. When that soul is truly converted, let that soul be rebaptized. Come just as you are. I know it's communion, it's the Sabbath anyway. Malls don't close till 9 o'clock tonight. 
Praise God, my sisters. True conversion. This is not time to be fooling around now. You, to lose your Savior is to be lost yourself. My appeal to you is take the roughest road to heaven and depart company with your dearest friend. To lose your Savior is to be lost yourself. Christ is gone. Life is gone. All is gone. Is there one more? Some husband. Some father. Some mother. Some brother. We're going to pray now. But I know there's somebody else out there. Your heart is palpitating. Don't let the enemy use an arrow to stop you this morning. Fight against principalities and powers and rulers. Let me tell you something, in brethren. You don't understand it. Church used to be a safe place to be in. Look around, brothers and sisters. Who knows? Maybe some lunatic may just come in here or sit here right now with an Uzi. You're going to sit there unsaved, unconverted, gamble with your salvation. We're going to pray now. As you bow your heads and your eyes are closed, nobody's watching now. You can come in and just slip from your seat right now. Beloved, let me tell you something. To take communion when your heart is not right, it is hypocrisy. And for some of us, communion can wash away your wickedness. You need to be born again. And until that happens, you'll never understand truth in its entirety. Is there one more? We are praying now, oh Father in heaven. Oh God, give us more of your spirit, dear Father. Some hearts are touched. And for some, almost thou persuaded me, Pastor Not. You almost persuaded me, man, to come forth. For some, it may be, Pastor Not, I have a convenient season. I'll come back next week. My dear friends, you may not be here next week. You may be in a morgue somewhere. Or your brain may not be able to think right. Father, please, we present these souls to you, dear God. Husband, wives, friends have come forward, dear Lord. Only you know their heart and their desire. But they have come this morning not for formal formality because they want a deeper walk. They want to be thoroughly converted, dear God. And according to their faith, dear Jesus, speed unto them. There are those, dear Father, who are still sitting now and they, they should come forth. I pray, oh God, that you will work upon their hearts and their minds. Give them no peace, no rest until they find the Prince of Peace. And Father, when you shall say to the North, give up, and the south keep not back. Bring my sons and daughters from the east, the west, the north, the south. Oh, Lord, wouldn't it be nice if we here at Acreage, when the saints go marching in, we walk in Jerusalem just like John. Thank you, O oh God, for what you have done. We embrace you in your threefold office as a prophet. as a priest and as our soon coming king this we ask in the all sufficient name blessed name of Jesus amen and amen you may return to your seats we have your cards and we will we will now have our closing hymn then we will separate for the foot washing the ladies are to my to, to my right and the gentlemen are to my left please we're asking you as you as you separate
quietly and let's do this expeditiously. We want to come back and bring this event to its close. We may stand for our opening hymn and as we're singing, we're going to ask the ladies to go to my right and the males to my immediate left.